Loading. Welcome to Access the Animus. Hello everyone and welcome to a new video here on Access the Animus. Today we have a packed video for you guys as we're going to have the first part of the full analysis of the story and lore of the Tombs of the Fallen activity for Assassin's Creed Valhalla, so spoiler alert starting here in case you haven't played it yet. In the video we're going to discuss the story that involved the Britons and their fallen leaders, their Roman antagonists and especially the engineer Manius Calvisius, and of course our Viking Yarskona Eivor, as they all one way or another double with a number of first civilization structures and buildings that acted like prisons during the Isu era. Thus we're going to try and unravel the story, proceeding in a chronological order until the Viking Age, setting up all the information we will need in order to discuss the events and characters connected to the Isu era in the second part of this video, which will come very soon. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking it, subscribing to our channel and turning the notifications on so you won't miss any of our future updates. And with that out of the way, let's dive into the story of the Tombs of the Fallen activity of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. One of the most interesting elements of the Tombs of the Fallen activity is that this is kind of a mini version of the historical narrative approach of the entire game, in that within the same environments we can find various historical layers, or to better put it, various stories belonging to different historical layers. In this specific case, within the same case we have narrative elements belonging to the Isu, some environmental storytelling and even some characters belonging to the Britons, a lot of documents and even architectural visual belonging to the Roman era, and of course we have our main character Eivor who is exploring all of this during the Viking Age. So what we're going to do here is to try and unravel all of this and proceed sort of chronologically, starting from the Britons, then going to the Roman side of things, then to the Viking Age, and in a second and follow up video we're going to have a deep dive into the underlying Isu narrative, of course with a focus on the Isu language words and the Hildran documents and even more connected content. And we decided to break this in two parts because there's a lot to talk about, so don't blink or you might miss some of the details. And we start with the Britons era, or let's say with the Briton side of the narrative. So not a lot to say about this, but if you have played the activity you will know that at some point the Britons decided to place the tombs of their fallen heroes, because that's where the activity takes its name from, in these specific caverns amidst the Isu obsidian like stones. The fallen heroes we're talking about here are military leader Cassivellaunus who died around or after 48 BCE. Boudica, queen of the Iceni tribe who died in 60 or 61 AD, and Venutius, king of the Brigantes group who actually died at least after 69 AD. So we can surmise that the Britons at the time of Cassivellaunus, Boudica and Venutius, maybe even earlier than that, did find the various Isu locations, maybe including the main one featuring the Isu map of England that we're going to see later, otherwise it would be tough to explain why they put the tombs of their heroes exactly and only in said locations. Yes, we're probably overthinking this, but anyway, if this were the case though, it would mean that the Britons had known of these tombs and their locations for at least a century, considering how far from each other these three Briton leaders really lived. Nonetheless, the activity provides documents that actually say that during the time of the Emperor Nero, while Britannia was already occupied by Rome, the Britons had started to gather around the tombs of their fallen heroes and that was seen as a threat by the Emperor himself. Keep this in mind as it's pretty much the whole premise as for why we can find the tombs but also the various puzzles and traps in these caverns. So let's focus on the Roman era, and we're calling it Roman era here but we're basically talking about a very similar historical period to that of the Britain's side of this story. Our main character here is Manius Calvisius, who was an engineer for the Emperor Nero and thus we're talking about events that started somewhere between 54 and 68 AD, that is the reign of the Emperor, and probably ended up later, considering how many buildings and structures were built by Manius in the caves, as we'll see. 
Anyway, he was tasked by the Emperor to prevent any assembly by their enemies in Britain, that is indeed the Britons, who had recently started to gather around the tombs of some of their fallen heroes, as we mentioned earlier. Nero's fear was that these gatherings might foment a rebellion against Rome and himself, and as such he decided to take action about that, but apparently his soothsayer told him that defiling such tombs would have been an ill omen for the Emperor, and that's why Nero tasked Manius to leave the tombs unharmed, but to rig their entrances with death traps, puzzles and every kind of contraption to make it impossible to access their final rooms and thus the actual tombs of the fallen Briton heroes. So Manius eventually did build several traps in the path that led to the tombs of the Britons without desecrating them, which you can see it, it is a bit of a convoluted plot but at least it provides a reason why the actual tombs are there untouched, but we have to go through some exploration and some puzzle solving to get there, which is not too bad in itself. At the same time though, that is also the reason why we can see some Roman architecture within underground caves amid some first civilization structures, which I really love to see, so honestly I can't complain too much about that. In his research, Manius found out that the locations where the Britons placed their tombs actually featured some stone structures that he had never seen before, and also he realized that these tombs weren't of their own making, so much so that he even went on to say that the structures might have been built by some quote unquote forgotten people. And this wouldn't even be the only case where he'd show his deduction skills. One would imagine that the first location found by Manius was the one where he set his workshop, or maybe that was the last one considering that there's no Britain tomb in there, but again this is where the Isu map of England is situated, with the various locations of the tombs, so it kind of makes sense that he put his own HQ in there. We can see from his documents that he believed that the task ordered by his emperor was nonsensical, but he still enjoyed engineering traps and had a strong sense of duty to his emperor. So he actually went on to build his workshop where he tested his traps on both humans, obviously Britons, and animals before placing them in front of the actual tombs. Anyway, Manius set himself to visit the tombs and found out how to open them and thus making the rock face disappear by quote unquote pure happenstance. The document narrating this can be found in front of the Boudicca tomb, so based on this we could also and instead imagine that this was the first tomb that he was able to visit, then afterwards he understood how to open all the other tombs. Interestingly enough, he does mention that he described the illusion that he just witnessed to Mercury, who is the Roman god version of Hermes, who within the Assassin's Creed lore, in turn, was an Isu engineer and scientist most famously known for the creation of the staff held by Pythagoras, Cassandra, Leila and then Basim, but this doesn't necessarily mean he was the one that created the illusionary technology that we're seeing here. Actually, considering that the illusionary rocks have an Odin illusionary rune on them, it's more likely that these are the workings of the Asgardian Isu, maybe Odin himself, especially considering how these Isu locations are also tied to Hilderun and her Isu progenitor, whom we're going to talk about in the second part of this video. By having a look at the document located in the ice cave before Venutius' tomb, we can see how Manius also mentioned how his quote unquote ardor for deadly devices got the best of him while working in the cave filled with swamps that I guess is the one before the Boudicca tomb. So again, it seems he started from there and then did the other tombs, including the Venutius one, which seems to have been the last one because while rigging it, Manius was running out of supplies. But possibly the most interesting document written by Manius is the one about the purpose of the caverns, which can be found on the way out of Venutius' tomb. In there, Manius says that it seems clear to him that the caves and the structures, long before the Britons came, had another purpose compared to the one chosen by the Britons themselves. Manius says he found evidence of restraints and that perhaps these locations were used as places of confinement, like prisons. For beasts of men, he asks, and that's an interesting question that can also spark some theories, which we're going to analyze again in the follow up to this video. In this document he also shows how he has become a little obsessed by the closed door in the main cavern, where he'd like to enter to know more about the nature of these structures, something he will write about in another document close to the entrance itself. 
And finally, the last we hear from Manius is exactly from that document, which is placed within the main cavern. He writes it after he has rigged all the Britain tombs, but while he has done that, he has indeed become obsessed by the final door placed in the main cavern, and he is quite disappointed that he is not able to open it, no matter what. Thus, it looks like Manius did not find any of the artifacts that instead Eivor found in the various tombs, so of course he didn't even know how to use them. Kinda like we don't. Such an identifiable character, huh? And thus we move on to the Viking Age at an undefined time after early 873 when Ravensthorpe was founded. And that's where the activity starts, with Eivor witnessing several animals losing their senses next to the river and close to the hill where the main ESO structure of this activity is located. Eivor tries to send Sunin to watch it, and while Sunin sees there's something wrong on the hill next to Ravensthorpe, she also behaves in a weird way and loses her course. But what matters the most here is that we're having another visual proof that Eivor sees through Sunin's eyes, the same ability possessed by Bayek and Cassandra from Assassin's Creed Origins and Odyssey. So Eivor investigates and on the hill she finds one of the infamous Odin runes that we have talked about so much, which is now glowing in a light blue light, and then touches it. Just doing this actually activates the first civilization pillar that was hidden behind the rock face, and once again Eivor asks herself what kind of magic this is. This is likely to be another consequence of making the content available for everyone at any time after reaching Ravensthorpe, as sadly Eivor is always surprised and never recognizes the first civilization technology and architecture, even if she is likely the character that has found the most artifacts within the franchise and has walked through the highest number of Isu temples, and yeah, it doesn't look that nice on the character. Eivor enters the tomb and finds lots of Roman architecture, but also an Isu door on the ground and the Isu version of what she identifies as a map of England, which features the locations of the cavern she's visiting now, along with the three tomb that she still has to visit. In here she finds out about the story of Manius, what he was tasked to do and what he set out to do, but also his thoughts about the first civilization buildings and technology that he saw and didn't understand, along with a document by him about how much he was obsessed with the final door which he wasn't able to open. So Eivor visits the tombs, in my case she visited the Boudica one first, then the Cassivellaunus one and then the Venutius one. Within each cavern, Eivor finds traps set by Manius, but eventually gets to their final chamber, which every time is clearly an Isu area with a Briton tomb placed inside of it. Entering these rooms causes Eivor to see somewhat of a ghost-like representation of our three Briton deceased leaders, who basically tell her their story. Of course, during our recent stream about the Tombs of the Fallen activity, we got a lot of questions about how this is happening, but the best explanation is the usual and old explanation that is hallucinogens. Yes, the ever so popular way to have Eivor see magical and unexplained stuff is back, and this time we can see that it's caused by some sort of smoke or incense that's placed over the three actual stone coffins of our Briton death leaders. And actually, that is even introduced when Eivor enters the chamber when the camera flickers and blurs, which is actually a visual way to show what's really happening. Technically, considering that these are then just hallucinations, whatever they say is kind of irrelevant for the sake of the story, because well, unless there's anything else within these first civ structures that's projecting these as actual real messages, Eivor is pretty much making them up in her own mind. What is real instead is the documents, the tributes that the other Britons left over their leaders' graves, but those are pretty much celebrations of their characters or just tell their story. Upon more exploring, after reaching the final area of the tombs, Eivor is able to find three tiny little objects called artifacts, which are surely Isu artifacts, as touching them triggers in her some Isu language words that she can stop herself from pronouncing, but that she also isn't able to understand at all. We're going to have a look at them in our next video, but suffice to say that Eivor already says that the words might be useful in some specific place. And that's sadly pretty much it, because as you might have seen already, the activity ends here a little abruptly if you ask me.
In fact, if you go back to the main tomb with Eivor, nothing happens. There's no slot to place the artifacts in, no place to pronounce the words, no nothing. Which pretty much means that there's going to be a part 2 of the Tombs of the Fallen activity at some point down the line. That is also proven by how the two Odin runes left in England and the three left in Ireland are now glowing with a light blue light, so it seems like we're going to have to wait for the ending of this activity at some point in the future. And that was it for the first part of our analysis of the first part of the Tombs of the Fallen activity. Join us in our next video where we're going to have a look at the Isu side of all of this, with the Isu prisons and who they might have contained, their ties to the story of the Mastery Challenge mode and of course a proper analysis of the Isu language words. As usual, let us know in the comments if you enjoyed the video, if you agree or disagree with our interpretations and what you think about the historical part of this activity. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in our next video.